This is Radio Equal Shock with your host, Alex Smith. Last week, I asked French scientist Olivier Boucher about the climate impacts of aerosols, the smog particles we launch into the atmosphere when we burn fossil fuels. He said that is hard to model. But new science finds another way than modeling by comparing the atmosphere now to a period around three million years ago. The continents were about the same then, and so were the CO2 levels, but the world was quite different. The results are astounding. This is hard science. Our guest speaks Chinese and English. If you listen, I promise climate news you have not heard before, and another kick to get us all going into rapid climate action. Buckle up. Radio Ecoshock. Ran Feng is an assistant professor with the University of Connecticut. Her new paper studies a period about three million years ago when a climate shift created the savannas where our first ancestors evolved. That climate past may be our future. Ran Feng, welcome to Radio Ecoshock. Thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure being here. I think we need to begin with some basics. Is it accurate to say that aerosol pollution is not caused by climate change and it exists as a separate ecological problem? Yes, but incompletely. While the part of yes meaning that the pollutant we uh, created uh, emitted and then gets transported in the troposphere since the Industrial uh, Revolution, Indeed, is created by human and has been created by human and um, continued on. Well, if we think about uh, forest fire, then the answer becomes a little bit different. If we're thinking about increasing forest fire activity, which is still active research on whether it's directly linked to climate change or it may also have some part with forest management then the pollution, you could say, if we proven, if we prove the link that the part of forest activity is induced by climate change, then we would also say that climate change may also play a role in increasing the amount of pollutants we have in the troposphere. Yes, they're interlinked, but I think people get them a little confused. They think, oh, well, climate change has created smog, but not really. No, I mean, it is the oil and and the coal and the gas that we burn that puts sulfates into the air that makes smog, but they're, they're sort of different problems. Yeah, it's different problem. While directly, I don't think it's caused by climate change, but indirectly, in terms of fire activity, then climate change could play a role. That part, the second part, is still under active research. I get you. Well, now, speaking about uh, research, in 2016 and 2017, scientists at Stockholm University, led by Juan C. Acosta Navarro, suggested a significant fraction of the Arctic warming we've seen has developed since sulfur emissions peaked back in the 1980s. Could you explain the relationship between smog reduction in the Northern Hemisphere and a hotter Arctic? Yeah, sure. So when you think about Arctic, the first thing that in your mind is that during the summer, the days are very, very long. So you have a lot of sunlight, the solar energy coming to the system, which makes the smog. And by changing the cloud properties, by making the cloud more reflective, very effective uh, in terms of making this whole area more reflective of sunlight. So what they find uh, is between 1980 and 2005, due to more strict uh, environmental regulations, Europe, the sulfur emission from the Europe has gone down. Without um, those smog, without those particles that form the cloud droplets and then uh, enhance the overall reflectivity of clouds, you start to have a less generally reflective earth especially in the Arctic part, which allows more sunlight to come in, especially so during the summer, which have caused the sea ice, at least in their research, to melt back, which then exposes the darker ocean surface and allows more sunlight to come in, then uh, subsequently causes this enlarged warming. In their study, they get 0.5 degrees Arctic warming, only with about a little bit 
3.3 watts per meter square increase in the net radiation. Um, the other component they find is when the smog is reduced uh, regionally uh, in the Europe, it changes the heating contrast between the land and the ocean in the way that it allows more atmosphere heat transport and allows more ocean heat transport during the summer to giving heat to the Arctic region that also contributed to uh, sea ice melt and the warming. Well, this is very important because we, thinking about this red-hot Arctic that we just experienced this summer, people are talking about the increased carbon dioxide, and that's true. That is causing more global warming. They're talking about methane, and, and there is more methane coming out. But they don't usually talk about the reduction in sulfates, uh, reduction in smog. And so here's a third factor that turns out to be quite important that the scientists are working on. Yeah, so this is very, very new. You probably noticed those papers. They all published within like the past four years. So I would say a lot of researchers, including myself, started to notice um, this very large effect uh, of sulfate aerosols and as well as other aerosol species that can help form clouds, that can help increase the reflectivity of clouds on the uh, climate system, especially including myself, what we find is Arctic seems to have this higher sensitivity to this forcing than a lot of other places around the world. And it's not just the Arctic. I mean, Navarro and his team also showed a global mean temperature would go up if current promises are, are, to reduce air pollution are kept. And they say if you slash the air pollution, the Earth's mean temperature could go up anywhere from a third of a degree to almost one degree C, they say. And that suggests Earth would already be much hotter without that smog shielding out some of the sun. Do you agree with that? Yes, that's what's very new right now. Um, there are two papers, one in science and one in nature, just published this year. I think one's in February and the one just published a few, a few days ago. They're all looking at how uh, much the radiative effect by altering the property of clouds from um, the anthropogenic pollutants would have on the overall radiation uh, budget of the Earth. And I think um, a lot of scientists agree that overall this part of the radiation effect of the aerosol is going to be a negative effect. So indeed, those pollutants through altering the cloud uh, reflection uh, have already cooled the Earth substantially. In addition to uh, what we know, which is direct uh, reflect and scattering of the sunlight by those little particles themselves. Well, it remains a little controversial on how much. It seems like on an intermediate scenario, the radiative cooling effect due to the effect on clouds could be around like minus 0.5, a little bit more than minus 0.5 watts per meter square, which is something around like 630 ppm CO2 equivalent. Well, a worst case scenario, it could be already masking something on the order of uh, 60% of the global warming we would otherwise have experienced without uh, pollutants that we put in the troposphere. Yeah, so a short conclusion is I think, yes, a lot of research have looked into this, and this is new because previously, I think most people were thinking about the direct reflection uh, and scattering of the sunlight by those tiny particles, and that effect is relatively small compared to the effect that the aerosols make the clouds more bright and last longer. Um, the latter is a bigger effect, and we become more and more realized that it's very important. But at this stage, it's still a very active research area. Wow. So we could possibly, and this is just possibly, get double the warming if we clean up the pollution. Now, to get to the bottom of that, and we need more science, your latest papers and accepted for publication in Geophysical Research Letters investigates a time around 3 million years ago, and it is called, and this will be a new word for many of my listeners, the mid piacensian period. Why did you look at that time? That's a great question. 
Yeah, so mid Piachendian, it's very hard to pronounce, <laughs> and even my colleagues um, are not like super thrilled about the name of the Thai. But it's a very cool period. It is very cool for two main reasons. First, it is the last time we saw a CO2 level similar to present day. There's a lot of there's good evidence. There's many many proxy proxy meaning we use uh, the geological record to um, estimate climate variables. So a lot of proxies agree that the CO2 uh, level during this time is very similar to present day. The other reason is this period of time has a continental distribution, continental configuration, like the land, sea, the coastal lines, the land, sea uh, shape, and as well as uh, the topography, like Himalayas, Andes, and all that. Very similar to present day. So by looking at that period, we can gain a future perspective of the current day Earth by looking at what the Earth was like during a period of time that are sort of equivalent to what we're heading to in the future. And what was the air like in that mid piacentian period three million years ago? Was it uh, polluted or clean or what? Short answer is you would not have any of the pollutants, like teratons and teratons of sulfate, um, organic particulate matter, like nitrous oxide and all that stuff. You would not have any of that produced by human activity in the air. And also you would have a less dusty air in general just because the climate is wetter and we, we have very limited glaciers only on the eastern side of Greenland and the eastern side of Antarctic. So that the overall wet climate and the much more reduced glacial erosion would be likely to give us a overall less dusty troposphere. On the other hand, my colleague uh, who I worked with during my postdoc at uh, University of Montana, they have records from Canadian Arctic. And in their records, they saw this interesting layers and layers of charcoal. Well, for present day, and if, especially for people who live in Canada, probably know this the best. If you go anywhere uh, above the tree line of the boreal forest, above, like, let's say, 65 degree north, you would not find forest fire activity. There's no fire activity. Well, for pleasing, those charcoal layers suggesting there's pretty active fire activity, which to us would suggest a different uh, state of biochemistry, uh, biogeochemical feedback being active at that time, meaning uh, there's probably a lot more widespread forest fire in the northern highland shield, which will uh, produce smog, one thing, but other uh, precursors for greenhouse gases, for example, tropospherical ozone could be produced through photochemistry, uh, while nitrous oxide uh, could be produced from precursors from the burning product. So in that sense, depending on where you go, you might still be running into pollution at this time. Even three million years ago. Yeah, but it's mainly from forest fire, so it's not human use. <laughs> right. If you have a story idea or thoughts on something you've heard, contact us, radio at org. That's radio at ecoshock.org. This is Radio Ecoshock. We are talking with Rand Feng from the University of Connecticut. A few years ago, it was fringe science to suggest the Arctic would be ice-free any time during this century. Now, all bets are off. We're not sure. What did you find out about an ice-free Arctic in that previous age when conditions were somewhat like our present? So it was very interesting that, in the sense that in the climate community, I think it has been thought for quite a while that uh, among the geologists who study this time period, that this time period should at least be seasonally sea ice free, uh, meaning during the summer season, probably not going to have extensive Arctic sea ice. Well, there's a Earlier evidence are all more or less qualitative, so they look at uh, the geomorphology in the high Arctic region, especially a lot of uh, work are done in Canadian Arctic, and they notice active uh, river channels, 
they mean that the place can't not be just be frozen all year round. Cannot have a uh, like a glacier sitting on top. While they also find high Arctic camel, which is unlikely to exist uh, if the place is really really cold. Uh, while more recently there are more quantitative geochemistry evidence um, that people were you were uh, be able to look at the atom. Uh, the carbon atom um, that are produced by um, ice diatom, that's the diatom living underneath the ice. And by marrying uh, this long chain carbon uh, atom compound, they can look at the abundance of the uh, sea ice diatom change through time. And it's quantitatively showing that Arctic uh, should be sea ice seasonally, summer specifically, sea ice free. For the Piacenzian time, they are consistent with qualitative evidence. So I think the evidence is pretty good for this time period, but it has been really difficult for models to reproduce、uh, with present-day CO2 level this、uh, summer sea ice-free Arctic Ocean. Until pretty recently, when our models started to be able to simulating、um, this process of forming clouds. From、uh, the small, small aerosol particles, this allow us to produce different cloud forming state in the troposphere with or without the pollutant. So, in our research, the first、uh, question we're interested in looking at is: Well, we know that for the mid-period change in time, we don't have、uh, industrial pollutants. So, but. For present day、uh, climate, we do, and for previous model simulations, the model doesn't have the capability of featuring this cloud interaction with aerosols. So we set up our, our experiment. We compared two experiment: one with the industrial pollutants, and the other one that we removed all the industrial pollutants. And the radiative forcing is enough, despite being、uh, small. Is enough to push the Arctic into a summer sea ice free state. So, in our simulations, what we started to learn is that for the mid-period change in time, whether or not、um, a simulation entering a summer sea ice free state is could be induced by、uh, the removal of anthropogenic pollutants, which would suggest that when we're thinking about future climate, we're already at 400 ppm CO2. By removing、uh, the anthropogenic pollutant, we're actually putting a greater risk to the Arctic community in terms of entering a different Arctic sea ice state, summer sea ice free. Okay, so we we know that cutting air pollution will reveal the true level of heating caused by our emissions, but could cleaner air boost even further warming if the sea ice is gone for a month or two during summer and fall? Could you talk to us about that? Yeah. So, what in our paper we find is that you guys probably have heard、um, the ice albedo feedback during the summertime, or just in general in for the Arctic region. If you have an increase in incoming solar radiation, you would melt back the sea ice. While sea ice reflects solar radiation, the fact that sea ice melted back. Is going to allow the surface to absorb more solar radiation, so the surface gets even warmer, which melts back the ice even more. So this process goes on and on. That's a positive feedback. So what we find in our paper is that when you look at the amount of net、uh, solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere. For、uh, winter season and for late fall season. In two cases, one with the pollutant, the other one without the pollutant, it's quite similar. So you only see when the case without pollutant start to absorb more solar radiation at the beginning of the summer, and we're able to see that in our model that this little boost of surface absorption by a little less cloud reflection. So actually, trigger、um, this so-called positive ice albedo feedback or positive、uh, runaway ice albedo feedback,、um, which actually allows 
the Arctic Ocean to reach a sea ice free state by itself through the positive feedback persisted through the season. We talk a lot about air pollution and the warming Arctic. Is there a similar activity happening at the other pole in the Antarctic? Right. So in the Antarctic, Antarctic is a little bit shielded from the rest of the world. Obviously, it's sitting at the South Pole and it's not connected to the, any continent. So it's hard for the pollutants to travel to and then deposit on uh, Antarctic. However, the bigger problem for Antarctic is actually uh, the emission of CFCs, which subsequently destroy ozone. And through the Montreal uh, Act agreement, a lot of countries have eliminated their emission to, of CFCs. But more recently, a group of research led by the Bristol Group, uh, University of Bristol Group, they discovered that uh, there's still CFC emissions coming out of China. Uh, from the observation station they have in Hawaii. So that has been a pretty big problem for our agreement to uh, protect the ozone. So Antarctic ozone hole is shrinking, but it should be shrinking at a faster rate as it is uh, compared to what it is now. And so fortunately, it seems like the CFC is still coming out of China. I think that's a, a bigger concern for now. And in the middle of the world, we have the tropics, and there you also investigated that ancient warming that was so similar to our present and and maybe our future. As published in Geophysical Research Letters in August 2019, what can the mid-Piacentian warming tell us about ocean currents and weather in the tropics? The interesting thing about the tropics is that we don't know how the tropical circulation could change in response to the increase in greenhouse gases, when we're looking to future predictions, there are theories about maybe it will strengthen. Uh, there are theories about maybe it will weaken in terms of the walker circulation. So the walker circulation is this circulation cell with rising air around the uh, Western Pacific warm pool. There is a puddle of really warm water and the rising air uh, from that region and penetrates into the troposphere, and this rising air uh, turns east and descends in the eastern side of the tropical Pacific and comes back to the western uh, tropical Pacific, and then this complete, this horizontal, this zoonal cell. So it's very hard to actually say whether this zoonal cell is going to weaken or is going to strengthen their series to support both sides. Well, we're able to show that by combining our climate simulations and um, the proxy data, the geochemical data uh, results, that from the ancient observations, we can say that our data and model support that the circulation cell is probably going to weaken. Well, this is from our opinion. You probably can interview somebody with different opinion, <laughs> to be honest. Well, this has the implications on the drought especially for the U.S. Southwest, because we know that U.S. Southwest is drought-prone when looking to the future, uh, just by looking from the perspective of greater evaporation uh, because of the hotter uh, land surface. But also there is element that if um, the water circulation is strengthening, that would correspond to the cooling sea surface, cooler sea surface temperature in the eastern uh, tropical Pacific, which actually would create a more drought-promoting uh, or precipitation-suppressing uh, atmosphere circulation condition for uh, the U.S. Southwest region. So that's uh, something that we can potentially gain insights by looking into the past climate that we have records, uh, or you can think of that we have observation on, on looking at uh, those controversial, I mean, still controversial uh, research topic at the present. So the science isn't settled yet, but is it possible that cutting air pollution could change storms or even the Asian monsoons that are vital for feeding billions of people in Asia? So, again, this is still also a pretty active research area. But I think even in the late 90s, People started, already started talking about the air pollution could have an effect on the 
general monsoon strength potentially, or the variability of the monsoon rainfall. And uh, the general idea is mog by itself, like from sulfate and all that, they could have a cooling effect of our region. Uh, while a large amount of our energy of the monsoonal circulation is actually set up by the land and ocean thermal contrast. So the idea is that during the summer, um, the air above the land area uh, then to be heated up first, and uh, that would develop the low pressure system that allows the monsoon flow uh, to transport, or that that would initialize the monsoon flow to carry the moisture from the ocean and uh, transport it on land. Well, if you put a large perturbation on this land sea thermal contrast, that will of course have effect on the circulation and hence on the monsoon precipitation. Ren Feng, as a young scientist, you already have a strong track record of publication. What direction are you heading in next? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so we just get funded uh, from NSF. Um, so we're, like those tropical study, uh, we're very interested in looking at the general tropical uh, state, uh, temperature state, and circulation state. Well, the other aspect is we're also interested in what precipitation look like uh, back in uh, mid pre-Shenzhen time, uh, which may serve an analog of our long-term changes into the future. And we just actually just got funded uh, to look at the mid pre precipitation uh, from the Gulf of California. So we're using this type of geochemical proxy called LIFWAX, uh, which is uh, deposited into the ocean and transported by rivers on land across a large area. So this integrated proxy can give us information on the general precipitation information of um, the U.S. Southwest. So we're very interested in looking at whether uh, this region uh, have more precipitation back in the mid pre time uh, or whether this region has been drier. Because when we look at future predictions, precipitation is one of the things that are really hard to predict. And by looking at uh, past changes, uh, focusing on this region, we can hopefully learn about the model skill and learn about what a warm world, what we would expect in a warm world in terms of precipitation changes. So this is one specific question. While well, my general interest uh, lies in both in terms of understanding the Earth's history, how climate interacted uh, with tectonics, how the mountain building have affected climate, and how does climate affect the ecosystem. Well, the other part of my research is to focus on understanding the model skill and to use some of the knowledge from past climate uh, to help provide some information about our future climate, uh, like those two papers that I did with a bunch of co-authors. We've been speaking with the author of brand new research titled Contributions of Aerosol Cloud Interactions to Mid Piacenzian Seasonally Sea Ice Free Arctic. And Ran Fang works with the University of Connecticut, and you can find links and more information in my weekly blog published at ecoshock.org. Ran, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you, Alex. It's my pleasure. Check out the Radio Ecoshock website. We're at ecoshock.org. So the Swedish team, led by Navarro, found that Europe's reduction of air pollution may have warmed the Arctic by half a degree C. That is because, as Ran Feng's research shows, we are looking at pollution the wrong way. It is true smog, especially sulfates from burning coal, oil, and gas, does bounce some solar radiation back into space. That cools the planet, perhaps half a degree, although the exact amount is uncertain. But the real cooling arrives because aerosol particles trigger more clouds that cool the Earth even more. The masking effect of global dimming is much greater than we thought. It is hiding perhaps half of the true warming that will be revealed as various countries clean up the air. They're trying to save millions of people from premature deaths. That is the awful position we are in. I hope some people will download Ran Feng's interview and listen to it again from my website at ecoshock.org. We need climate watchers to take this apart 
and communicate key points to a wider public. Go on, put it in social media, blog about it, talk about it. Help get new climate science out there. I'm Alex Smith. Thank you for listening this week and caring about our world. Radio Ecoshock.